in one of the darkest times in human history, when the voice of God was silent for 400 years. Suddenly, without notice and without provocation, redemption came to all man. And on an old rugged cross, on the stony hills of Calvary outside of the city of Jerusalem, the sins of mankind were redeemed one final time as God expresses his love for all of man when he poured his wrath on his son at a cross and it appeared that evil had won he rose and he was resurrected he lives that we may live The irony of this world is that we are a people that with all of our wealth, our lives remain a wilderness of want. We live in a time when we are killing ourselves in an effort to appear successful. We sacrifice our health to make all this money and then have to surrender all our money to retain our health. We are a people looking for a peace of mind and alcohol who try to eat our way into personal fulfillment, who try to smoke their way to unsettled nerves who constantly attempt to motivate ourselves to a place of personal fulfillment, who bully their way to the top of the social, corporate, and religious ladder of futility, nations who sell their souls to barter for world peace. But I've been sent by a guy that can make a poor man rich, where an ignorant man can find wisdom, where an evil man can be made righteous, where a bad man can be made good, and a good man can be made better, and a dead man can be made alive. And I've come to tell you his name is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, the Great Commission is based on the claims of Jesus Christ's lordship of both the living and the dead. In Romans 14, 7 through 9, and then verse 11, it says, For none of us lives to our flesh, and none of us dies to our flesh. For if we live... We live unto the Lord, and if we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For as it is written, and for this cause, excuse me, for this cause Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11, the Bible says, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that in the name of Jesus Christ every knee shall bow, of things in heaven, of things in the earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Lord means ownership. It's an acknowledgement of His ultimate authority, a mark of respect, and an implied pledge of obedience. Lord also represents what we ought to do since we have been redeemed. In Acts chapter 2, verse 36, the Bible says, Therefore let all of the house of Israel know that God hath made this same Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and and Christ. The greatest respect you can say when you are confessing Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's a title of honor. It's a title of respect. When people come and say, Jesus, 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 but they do not acknowledge Him as Lord and Savior, I often wonder, do they truly understand the price that was paid for their sins? In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not made anything that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that lights every man that comes into the world excuse me, that all people through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. 
That was the true light that lights every man that comes into the world. The very next verse, this is talking about Jesus Christ. He was in the world, and the world knew him not. He, excuse me. He, he was in the world. He, he made the world. He was in the world, and the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them which believe on his name. In the same author, in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, the Bible says, which that, which that which we have known from the beginning, which we have seen with our eyes, and which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, which is the word of life, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and our, truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message we have heard of Him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with the other, and the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, cleanses us from all our sin. If we say we have not sinned, we are a liar, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In Ephesians 1, verses 19 through 23, and what is the exceeding power of his, excuse me, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand, in the heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion, and every name that is a name, not only of this world, but also in the one that is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things in the church. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 through 19, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, and whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the first beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things Christ himself might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that should in him should all the fullness dwell. Beware, Colossians 2, verse 8. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. I want to stop here for just a moment. Be being a minister and a businessman at the same time, I get a lot of ads, unfortunately. I noticed during this Easter season, a lot of so-called pastors have given me advertisement for their future books that are coming out. It saddens me that on the Easter holiday, that the only thing they have to talk about is to be blessed. You know, this isn't about you. And this crash commercialism of the Christian faith at the most holiest time of the year demonstrates we are woefully ignorant of why we're doing what we're doing. I'm sure these people are nice guys. I'm sure they mean well. But their doctrine and their theology and their purpose and their motivation is to make money. And Christ, and there's nothing wrong with that unto itself. But don't you think, seriously, don't you think that at this holy time of the year, when every person looks inside themselves for reflection and has to, has for just a moment leaves the commercialism of this world that Easter is to remember the reason that we're called Christians in the first place. To cheapen it with crash commercialism, pyramid religionism, false spiritualism. Let me say this again and I'll say it to you. This is not your best life. If this is your best life, you are in some serious trouble. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And there's nothing wrong with encouraging, there's nothing wrong with edifying, there's nothing wrong with exhorting, but my God, do you all have to do it all the time. 
you might want to think about why you're doing it. And you might want to start thinking about pleasing him instead of your neighbor or some guy that can fund yourself. Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 4. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manner spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. John 1, 14. I want to go back to that verse for just a moment. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory among us, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I want to talk to you about the Word became flesh. The relationship of the fulfillment of Jesus Christ as the Word made flesh is expressed in every single book that has been written by the Holy Spirit. Let me give you an example. In the book of Genesis, Jesus Christ is the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he is our high priest. In Numbers, he's the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he is the prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, he's the commander of the Lord's army. In Judges, he is our judge and lawgiver. In Ruth, he is our kinsman redeemer. In 1 and 2 Samuel, he's the, of the seed of David. In 1 Kings and 2 Kings and 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles, he is our reigning king. In Ezra, he's the faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he's the rebuilder of everything broken. In Esther, he is our Mordecai, our advocate. In Job, he is our ever-living redeemer. In Psalms, he's our shepherd. In Proverbs, he's our wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, he's the meaning for life. In the Song of Solomon, he's the loving bridegroom. In Isaiah, he's the prince of peace. In Jeremiah and Lamentations, he is our weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he's the glorious God. In Daniel, he's the fourth man in the fiery furnace. In Hosea, he's the faithful husband. In In Joel, he's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In Amos, he's our burden bearer. In Obadiah, he is our judge and savior. In Jonah, he's the risen prophet. In Micah, he's the ruler of the world from Bethlehem. In Nahum, he's our stronghold. In Habakkuk, he's our watchman. In Zephaniah, he's mighty to save. In Haggai, he's the restorer. In Zechariah, he's the branch of David, who the one pierced for us. In Malachi, he was the son of righteousness. In the New Testament, in the book of Matthew, he is the King of kings, the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. In Mark, he's the servant miracle worker. In Luke, he's the baby in the manger and the son of man. In John, he's the son of God. In Acts, he's the Savior of the world, ascended to God. In Romans, he's the justifier. In 1 Corinthians, he's the resurrection. In 2 Corinthians, he is our comfort. In Galatians, he is our liberty. In Ephesians, he's the head of the church. In Philippians, Philippians, he is our joy. In Colossians, he is our completeness and the glue that holds our world together. In 1 and 2 Thessalonians, he's the coming king. In 1 and 2 Timothy, he is our mediator. In Philemon, he is our benefactor. In Titus, he's the blessed hope. In Hebrews, he is our perfection. In James, he is the power behind our faith. In 1 and 2 Peter, he is our chief shepherd. In 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he is our truth and everlasting life. In Jude, he's the foundation of our faith, our security. In Revelation, he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus had no servants, yet they called him master. He had no medicine, yet they called him healer. He, He had no army, yet kings feared him. He won with no military battles, yet he conquered the world. He committed no crime, yet they crucified him. He was buried in a tomb, yet lives today. So who is this Jesus of Nazareth? He is the God who transcends human medication. He cured the sick and the blind without administering a single dose of drugs. He transcends our laws of economics. He disproved the law of diminishing returns by feeding 5,000 men with two fishes and five loaves of bread. He transcends scientific physics. He disproved the law of gravity when he ascended into heaven. He transcends biology because he was born without the normal concession. He transcends chemical formula because he turned water into wine. He is above human government. He said that he would be called wonderful counselor, the mighty God, and the everlasting peace. He transcends traditional earthly religion by becoming our God of worship. No one comes unto the Father but by him. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the king 
keeper of creation and creator of all. He is the architect of the universe and the manager of all times. He always was, always is, and always will be. Unmoved, unchanged, undefeated, never undone. He was bruised and brought healing. He was pierced and ears pain. He was persecuted and brought freedom. He was dead and brought life. He reigns and brings peace. The world can't understand him. The armies can't defeat him. The schools can't explain him. The leaders can't ignore him. Herod couldn't kill him. The Pharisees couldn't confuse him. The grave couldn't hold him. Nero couldn't crush him. Other religions can't replace him. And the world can't explain him away. He is light, love, longevity, and Lord. He is goodness, kindness, gentleness, and God. He is holy, righteous, mighty, powerful, and pure. His ways are right. His word is eternal. His will is unchanging, and his mind is on us. He is my redeemer. He is my savior. He is my guide. He is my peace. He is my joy. He is my comfort. Jesus Christ is Lord and the ruler of my life. <clears throat> if you will look in the green dome in Medina, Saudi Arabia, you will find the bones of one of the prophet Muhammad. If you look in Jingchow County, China, you will find the bones of one they called Buddha. In the Cemetery of Conference in Jaxing, China, you will find the bones of Confucius. In the Smith Family Cemetery in Navajo, Illinois, you will find the bones of Joseph Smith. And in the Westminster Abbey in London, England, located near the grave of Sir Isaac Newton, you will find the bones of Charles Darwin. All their physical bodies remain embalmed in their graves, but on a street called Strait in the city of Jerusalem, the grave of Joseph of Arimathea remains empty with an overhand sign saying, He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. He's not there. He's not there. He's gone. Grave could not hold God Himself. Matthew 28, verses 2 and 7. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. And his countenance was at lightning and his raiment white as snow, and the fear of him did the keepers shake and became as dead men. Battle-tested Roman soldiers at the sight of an angel dropped dead from fainting. And the angel answered and said to the woman, Fear ye not, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. He is risen. Come and see the place where the Lord lays. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There you shall see him, for I have told you. And Matthew 16, verses 4 and 8. And when they looked, the women had come to the grave, and when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he said unto them, Be not affrighted, you seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen, he is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he that goeth before you into Galilee that there you shall see him, as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fed from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were all afraid. Luke chapter 24, verses 3 and 8. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they had perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood in them in shining garments. And as they were afraid, they bowed their faces to the earth and said unto them, why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke unto you while he was yet at Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. On the road to Emmaus there were two men, and certain of them which there were... And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the woman had said, but they saw him not. Then he said, Jesus has come to these men to test them and to help them understand why things took place like they did. Let me start again. 
And certain of them which were with us went into the sepulcher and found it even as the woman had said, for they saw him not. And then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe, all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village, whether they went, and made as though they would have gone farther, but he disappeared after he had broke bread with them. The Christian faith is predicated and got its teeth and its wheels from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 8. It said, for I delivered unto you that, this is the Apostle Paul speaking. You see, Paul is dealing with the resurrection of the dead, something few churches have any courage to do. For I delivered unto you that which I first received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And then he was buried and then he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. And it goes, and then he was seen of Cephas and then of the twelve. And after that he was seen by five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain of this present, but the same are now asleep. And then, after that, he was seen of James and then all of the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as a horn due out of time. There are also other records of Jesus as the Christ. The most prominent one coming from the book, the Latin book, Testonium Flavinum, meaning the testimony of Flavius Josephus, is a passage found in book 18, chapter 3, verse 3, or see the Greek text, of the antiquities which describes the condemnation and the crucifixion of Jesus at the hands of the Roman authorities. The testimonium is probably the most discussed passage in that entire book. And I, this, I so begin the reading of that, starting in verse 3. Now there was a time when Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure, he drew, over them, he drew over them many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal man among us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared unto them alive again on the third day, as the divine prophets have foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him, and the tribe of Christians so named after him are not extinct to this day. He also makes another reference concerning Jesus' brother, and there are some churches that say that Mary never had other children. Let me tell you something. There are four brothers named and a multitude of sisters implied as Jesus' brothers and sisters. One of these was James, the one who wrote the book of James. His record is found also in the book of Flavius Josephus, book 20, chapter 9. And I read, When therefore Ananias was of this disposition, he thought he had a proper opportunity to exercise his authority. Festus was now dead, and Albanius was but upon the road. So he assembled the Sanhedrin of judges and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James. Again, a testimony to the reality, a non-biblical testimony of the Christhood of Jesus Christ. Choose to believe it, choose not to believe it. It's maintained its historical accuracy. Now let me say, but Flavius Josephus is not canonized scripture because of some of his doctrine about John the Baptist. So they did not canonize that book, and I don't think they should. Because the Bible, what the Bible says about John the Baptist and Herod Antipas is completely contrary to the book of Flavius Josephus. And that then and there disqualifies it for Holy Scripture. But he does make mention of the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and it's worth noting that there are writings of Christ in other books besides the Bible. So it was evident in third, third century, first century Palestine, that Christ did exactly what he did. So you have not only the Bible, but you have history, and down recorded through religion and mythology, the legend of Christ, as well as the reality of Christ, making this uh, without question an event that transpired and took place. So always remember, this Easter is about this. Amen? I don't care if you write a book. I don't care if you lead a church. I don't care what you do. But you got to have Jesus Christ as the center of it. And the Christian faith has forgotten this. I would imagine when I turned that television set on, if I wanted to watch Christian television on Easter morning, there would be very few subjects that deal in any depth about the significance of that holiday outside of a few dedicated and devoted ministries. So please... If we're ever going to turn this country around, this has got to come back to the preeminent message coming from the pulpits of Jesus Christ. And if it doesn't, we're going to fail.
except for a remnant. We must turn back to this and we must use this occasion to remember why we exist in the first place. Your crowds will go down. Let me tell you something, your crowds have already gone down. God has already weaned some tares from the wheat. And he's not done. So be that part of the remnant that holds to the truth and never, ever gives up. Jesus Christ, in the book of John, talks about his relationship as eternal and pre-incarnate. I'm going to use, I know I've done this, this before, but I'm going to use just the, the highlights of this so that you know and is it appropriate. The I am's of Jesus Christ. Number one, I am the bread of life. Notice that every one of these I am's are life-sustaining elements. Bread, life, life. All of these things are life-sustaining elements that without them you cannot live on this earth and without this you cannot live in eternity in life with Jesus Christ. John 6, verses 35, and then we'll jump to verses 48 through 51. Jesus said to him, I am that bread of life. He that cometh unto me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat wilderness and manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread that comes down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. Amen? Number two. I am the light of the world. Jesus spake unto them, I am the light of life. I am the light of the world. He that believeth on me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And John 8, 58, the most controversial verse, and if nothing else got him, uh, stirred them up to crucify him, it simply is this, before Abraham was, I am. The next one is the resurrection and the life. The total spiritual economy in one simple statement with Jesus as the headship. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth on me shall never die. Believeth thou this. Stop and consider that eternity is a decision that you're making tonight. If you turn this on and you do not understand that he is the bread of life, he is the light of the world. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the door of the sheep. He is the light of the world. He is the good shepherd. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And he is the true vine that saves the souls of men. John 9, 45, he repeats that he's the light of the world. I must work the works of him while it is day. For when night comes, no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. In John chapter 10, verses 7 through 10, I am the door of the sheep. Then said Jesus again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. The reason he's saying that is he said a parable unto them a few verses earlier. It says, He that entereth not into the sheepfold by the door, but cometh up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that comes through the door is the shepherd of the sheep to whom the porter opens, and the sheep know his voice, and he leads them out, and he calls them by name, and leads them out. And when he le after he leads them out, he goes before him, and his sheep follow him, for they know his voice. But the voice of strangers they will not follow, but will flee from him, for they knoweth not the voice of strangers. And then he says, I am the door of the sheep. There's a lot of people, a lot of false Christs, a lot of false priests, a lot of false prophets, a lot of false everything, hijacking the Christian faith and using their voices as the voice of Christ and sending innumerable souls, damnable souls, to hell at their work. And they think they're doing God's work, but they're agents of Satan, they're agents of darkness, they're agents of the night, and they have no interest but their own agenda. Romans 16, verses 16 through 17, the Bible says... I charge thee, therefore, brethren, that thou, that thou mark those which change the gospel to their benefit. For they that are such serve not the Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and through fair speeches and good works deceive the hearts of the simple. It's frustrating sometimes. That's why it's hard to do this. In John 10, verses 11 through 15, the Bible says, I am the door, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own sheep 
are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep and am known of them. As the Father hath known me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And John 14, verses 1 through 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And John 15, 1 through 7, he says, I am the true vine. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he cuts it off. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it might bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the words which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, because a vine cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, nor can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Every branch, that he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. He is the one who gives us this. You see... At the start of this video, you're going to see the resurrection depicted on this Easter holiday. But there's more to it than that. It's not just the light coming out of the grave. It is the redemption of all mankind. And now because the Spirit of God, now because your sins have been forgiven you, the Spirit of God, which ushers in the presence of God, can now live in you. I have dealt with countless ministries that don't believe this is true. There is nothing further from the truth. You do not have to call the Spirit of God from some place, some distant place, as an indifferent deity, that if you get praise and worship the right way, He'll come to you. The Spirit of God lives in the hearts of every regenerate human being that has taken Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. To that degree of each man is the measure of faith upon that absolute truth in which they respond, both in worship and in works, that they may have more of God or less of God depending on their obedience to the Word of God. Amen? He gives us His presence through the Spirit. In John 14, verses 12 through 18, the Bible says, Truly, truly, or verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works in thee shall he do, because I go to my Father. And if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knows him not, for he dwells in you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. In verse 26 and 27 of the same chapter, he says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever we have said unto you. Peace I leave with you. My peace give I unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. In John 15, verses 20, verse 26, the Bible says, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. In John chapter 16, verses 7 through 13, the Bible says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, then the Comforter will not come. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he is come, he shall reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to the Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it? When the Spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that he shall speak. And he will show you things to come. In John chapter 20, verses 21 through 22, it says, Then John, Jesus said unto them, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. 
in Acts chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. And being assembled together with him, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And when they were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore the kingdom again to Israel? And he said unto them, Is not for you know the times or the seasons which the Father had put under his own power, but you shall receive see power after that the Holy Ghost is coming upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. In Romans chapter 8 verses 13 through 17, for if we live after the flesh, we shall die. But if we through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of our body, we shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear but have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. In Galatians 4, 3 through 7, it says, Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your heart, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son and of a son, than an heir of God through Jesus Christ. See, you need that. You've got a story to tell. That spirit directs you to Jesus Christ. And without it, the, world, the word will not get put out. It's just not going to. You need the Holy Ghost to be a preacher of the word. You see, life and death are in your words. And he requires... The required and personal commitment and obedience to his words for us, for his presence to dwell in us. Everybody thinks they're going to heaven, but most aren't. And this is the broadside in the water line in Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Therefore, whosoever, whosoever shall hear these sayings of mine and do them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it did not fall, because it was founded upon a rock. But whosoever therefore hears these sayings of mine, and does them not, shall be like a foolish man, which built his house upon sand. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. In John chapter 14, verses 20 through 44, 20 through 24, the Bible says, At that day you shall know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them is he that loved me. And he that loves me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And Judas saith unto him, Not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself to us and not into the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man loves me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode unto him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which you hear is mine, but the Father which sent me. The Great Commission, that neglected aspect of your relationship with God. We do not seek. I, can, I know the eternal in my heart. I know that he does not do this to seek his own glory. And I do not seek to do this at my age. But I have a compassion and I have a passion to tell this world about Jesus Christ. Because I do not want to go and look at the face of God and say that I failed to tell them the truth. You have a job. Every one of you. Do not look at the most charismatic or talented or the best orators or the wealthiest of us to bring the gospel. We are all called to do this. In Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, the Bible says, And Jesus came unto them and spoke unto them and said, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even into the ends of the world. In Mark 16, verses 15 through 17, he says, And he saith unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. Not just the ones that think like you, and talk like you, and act like you, and believe the same thing you do. Preach to everything and everyone. Be indiscriminate of those that like you or dislike you. Preach to everyone as though your very life depended on it. Because theirs does. 
He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. In my name they shall speak with new tongues. They, they, <coughs> excuse me. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm them. They shall lay their hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Let's talk about who he is real quick. In Revelation, because it, he came down from the cross, but he is not. He has not taken the likeness of the suffering carpenter from Nazareth. He has changed. Revelation 1, verses 13 through 16. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks came one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment to the foot, and girt about the paps with golden girdles. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were a flame of fire. And his feet were like unto fine brass, as if they burned in the furnace, and his voice the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the shun as the sun shineth in its strength. In Revelation 2, he describes himself this way. These things saith he that hath the sharp two-edged sword with two edges. Revelation 2.18, These things saith the Son of God who hath eyes like a flame unto fire and feet like fine brass. Revelation 3, verses 1 through 6, 1, he says, He that hath the seven spirits of God, well, that's not it. He said, He who is dead and is alive, he who has the seven spirits of God and seven stars, and I know thy works, and thou hast a name which thou hast kept, and is not dead. Revelation 3 through 7, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, and openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man open. He is the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16, this is how he's going to appear when he splits the eastern sky to take up his rightful place in the temple of King David. And I saw heaven open, Revelation 19, 11. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven, the Old Testament saints, the New Testament saints, the angelic host and the true church of Jesus Christ is sitting behind him on a white horse, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And when he steps forth off into the balconies of heaven and goes towards earth, there will go a sharp two-edged sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. To the Christian, he is your shepherd, as he is talking about. To the sinner and the opportunist and the demonic and the evil and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie, they will have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. But unto those tonight who give their life to Jesus Christ, I'm going to put a little twist on the the 23rd Psalm, it says, I shall not want for anything. Yes, that's been added. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I will not want anything else. I shall not want for rest because he makes me lie down in green pastures. I shall not want for quenchment. He leads me besides the still waters. I shall not want for forgiveness for he restores my soul. I shall not want for guidance. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I shall not want for companionship, for it says, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for he will always be with me. I shall not want for comfort. His rod and staff, they comfort me. I shall not want for substance and provision, for he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I shall not want for joy, because my cup runneth over. I shall not want for anything in this life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall not want anything in eternity. For I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We're not going camping to live in a tent or to dwell temporarily in a tabernacle. We will dwell in a land where we will never grow old. We will dwell in the silence of the night is interpreted by love. We will dwell in the unpolluted region of an uncloudy day. We will dwell in the foundation of a city whose builder and maker is God. We will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the most holy day of the year. 
For this purpose was the Son of God manifested to destroy the works of the devil. I come to you as his emissary, his ambassador. Time is running out. And the same old religion is not going to work any longer. He is calling his people home. He is calling his people back. He's calling the backslider. He's calling the apostate. He's calling the evil. He's calling the worldly. He's calling the rejected of this world. He's calling those, whosoever will, let him come. It says in the Bible, Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. We're concluding our service now with prayer. But we are also never going to assume that almost 10,000 people who have subscribed to this in some sort of social venue do not care enough to listen to these words and examine their own hearts. We have a national and international audience of people who look upon this as the words of God, not the words of a man, because this is never intended to be the words of a man. Tonight we present to you Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And that is our message, plain and simple. And if you want me to preach for you, if you want me to teach, if you want me to do whatever, first and foremost, on my heart and in my head, is Jesus Christ. Yes, all the scripture is relevant. All of it. From the prophetic, to the historical, to the encouraging, to the edification. It begins and ends with Jesus Christ. The Old Testament begins with the coming of Jesus Christ to be our Savior. And the New Testament ends when he comes to be our Lord. The greatest scientific formula ever is one out of one of you are going to die. And you're going to be with him. And you're going to hear two statements. Well done, good and faithful servant, or depart from me, worker of iniquity. If you have invested your life in ministry, if you have invested in your life in the service of the Lord, remember why you do it. Remember for the purpose with which your heart fluttered when Christ asked you to serve him in whatever office he asked you to do it. Cast this world out of your life. It offers you nothing, and it doesn't care when you leave. Of all the funerals that I've ever done, all the people I've seen pass into eternity, that did not know Jesus, it didn't end well for them. And it won't end well for you. I'm offering you tonight salvation in Jesus Christ. I am offering you eternal life in his name, his spirit, and his word as it's been assigned. Tonight, if you left this earth and went into eternity, are you sure that you know him? Because eternity depends on the truth of that statement. You might, con your, you might con your wife. You might con your husband. You might con your parents. You might con your kids. You might con your brothers and sisters. And you might con your pastor and your elders in your church. But I can assure you, there is nothing that you've done that he has not seen, heard, or been a part of your entire life. So tonight, do not risk eternity on this most holy of days because you think someone's not going to like the fact that you're a Christian. Be a man or woman of character and stand up and do the right thing and stop worrying about what everybody else thinks about you and put your heart in Jesus Christ because that's the only one that's going to matter in eternity. The soft voice of God is calling into the darkness for the souls that want to know him. And as we enter into prayer, I ask you, I beg you, do not let your eternity stand in the opinions of people. Give your life to Christ. This world offers you nothing. And judgment's coming to it anyways. Your peace will come from heaven and eternity. And that's a much happier place than any successful business, religious, or whatever enterprise you seek. I'm asking you for two minutes to pray with me as souls decide eternity. If you are my friend, if you're truly my friend, for just two minutes, I'm asking you to hold hands and open your hearts and agree with me as souls and decisions are made for eternity because that's what this message is about. Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, we've done the very best we know how to do. 
to demonstrate and manifest your will and your purpose to this earth. We come as ambassadors and pilgrims, both Dee and I, that we have a message to tell. And it's not going to be the most popular. And it's not going to be everything for everyone. But to the lonely, to the broken, to the defeated, to the heartbroken, to those that are lost, in darkness, in bondage, in captivity, soul and spirit, you have a chance tonight to be liberated because the same words then were true and remain true to this day. They have been able to transcend human thought, human purpose, and human behavior for over 2,000 years. But time is running out. And the last bell for the souls of men is being rung by the voices of God in this earth to repent and to give their life to Jesus and be in eternity with Him. I want you to repeat these words after me. If I have spoken to your heart today, wherever you are, Father, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I come to you a sinner in need of a Savior. I, ask, I just simply ask you, there's no formula for this, it's a matter of the heart. I simply ask you to forgive my sins. I fall on the sword of your mercy. I know you hold eternity in your hands and you have given us your Son to liberate us from our sins. I don't always understand how salvation works with all the voices, but I know that Jesus Christ died to save me from my sins and I'm asking you and I'm asking Him to become Lord of my life by virtue of being the Savior of my soul. To be my Lord and Savior forever and forever. To occupy a place in my heart and to keep my foot from moving into this world again. Father, I'm tired of this world. I'm tired of what it's done to me. I'm tired of what it's done to my family. I'm tired of what it's done to my, my, uh, my co-workers, my friends. I'm tired of the devastation, the sudden death, the illness and the sickness and disease and all the uncertainty that this world has. Father, I just want your peace. Give it to me and your son, Jesus Christ. And I'll surrender my will to yours, Father, Lord God. And I will abandon my worldly thoughts and I will come to you just as I am to serve you. Be patient with me. And help me to find that place of destiny in Jesus Christ. In his name I pray. Amen and amen.